Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation. This is this week's issue of the Libertarian Angle. Richard is there imbibing, as he always does before these shows, as you can tell by the quality of his remarks. Richard, welcome back to another round of Libertarian Angle. Uh, I, I think I'm pleased to be back. Now, you viewers and listeners, I've known this guy for scaringly decades. Do you see the abuse I've had to put up with? I can't believe I'm such a tolerant and, and, and person that I can handle this. I mean, this is terrible. But for the sake of the freedom movement, I endure. I endure. <laughs> look, look, Richard, you're getting a lot of acclaim for this Austrian economics book that you've just done. And for FFF and the video series that you did, you're going to Francisco Marroquin University yes. in Guatemala uh, based uh, to give lectures based on it. But what you're not telling anybody is that I taught you everything you know about Austrian economics. <laughs> Trust me. When I met this guy a long time ago, he didn't know a freedom from a slavery. I had to cure all of his errors, mistakes, leaks. It was, it was try it's so embarrassing, I'm afraid to even talk about it. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of embarrassment, I thought we would talk about so socialism today. And the reason you might find that embarrassing is that it might expose your own little commitments to socialist programs. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we'll find out in the course of this conversation. Um, yeah, I thought it's important, Richard. You know, this word socialism gets bandied about. Right. Uh, we, we see it in the in the campaign where people accuse Hillary Clinton of being a socialist. And, of course, you know, right. we can also talk about economic fascism. That's what they accuse uh, Trump of being. So I thought it'd be, right. Right. it's nice to, to discuss the economic aspects, the philosophical construct behind the term right. socialism. I mean, you know, in the pure right. sense, socialism really is an economic system where the government owns everything, all the means of production. Everybody works for the government. Uh, I saw this firsthand when I visited Cuba many years ago. I mean, it was it just I had studied socialism, but it didn't dawn on me that everybody works for the state under socialism. I mean, everybody's a government employee. And obviously right. that means that everybody behaves. And, and I, I, this came through loud and clear when I was talking to this guy who really was a libertarian in, there in Cuba. And I said, um, I said, so if they fire you, then you starve. And he says, that's exactly right, because the sole employer – is the state now? There, there. They had some outlets, like little private markets, and people were running in little restaurants in their homes and stuff. But very, very small type of private activity. You know, like 99 percent of it was state governed and state owned. And he said, he says, no, they, they're never really that vicious, where they would just fire somebody, where they they just starve to death. Uh, but if you get into trouble with the authorities, if you dissent in a way that they don't approve of, what they would do at least with respect to young people who had not been married yet, they would separate and they would transfer them to a division of the government in a separate town across the other side of the island, which would separate girlfriends and boyfriends. And so that was the way that they would keep everybody straightened out. So, so you have this system where the state owns everything. And, of course, the result is, as we see in Cuba, as we see in North Korea, is just abject poverty. And as I've often argued, Richard, that 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 the, the whole mindset of the left, the liberals, the the the, the, the status, is really orienting toward that socialist model. Now, you know, very few of them call for total government ownership of everything, but I've often pointed out that the welfare state really is a variation of the socialist model. That it it has all the characteristics of the socialist mindset, the idea that that you should take money, the state should take money from one group of people and give it to another group of people is really just an embodiment of Karl Marx's dictum from each according to his ability to each according to his need, and that you have the same results that take place. You have an impoverishment of people. 
So despite the fact that they, Lyndon Johnson called it a war on poverty, and that's what the left calls it with the, all their welfare state programs, that really what they do is that they suppress economic growth. They ensure that people at the bottom of the economic ladder can't climb out uh, as they would in an unhampered market economy. So let me stop there and throw it over to you and let you give a little introduction into your concept of socialism. Well, uh, if, if I can, let, let me sort of give sort of the historical context. The fact is the, the notion of, of the communist ideal, the communal ownership, the communal sharing, the communal working and living, uh, is as old as uh, the ancient world. Uh, for example, you find a version of it in uh, the ancient Greek philosopher Plato in his famous uh, book, the, the Republic. Now, it's a very controversial. Some, some people try to say that Plato didn't mean it, or it was a satire, or it was merely sort of a metaphor. But the fact is, is that if you read Plato's Republic, uh, he, he does present an image of what hypothetically is, in his mind, one version of an ideal state or society. And in this ideal of state and society, uh, there are the philosopher kings, and there are the people who, who do work, and then there are the minions. Uh, but the issue came up is that, well, what if the city-state is challenged by threats from the outside, uh, those who might attempt to plunder or seize uh, your own city-state? Uh, do we not need certain people in the society who will serve as warriors, as guardians? Now, Plato then says is that uh, if, 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 if we are to have a separate group of people in our city-state who will be the warriors, the guardians, to protect the city-state from external aggressors, what protects us from the human proclivity for avarice, greed, possessiveness? Uh, what prevents those who are the warrior guardians from being pulled by these human nature elements of avarice and greed and possessiveness to, to want to now use their specialization in the division of labor, the use uh, of, of warrior skills to plunder or oppress uh, the very people whom they're to protect. In other words, who guards us from the guardians? Now, Plato then says that the best way to see that the guardians do not act uh, in, in a manner that would be inconsistent with their role of protection rather than plunder, is, is to change the institutional setting in which they will live and function. Uh, and how do you change human nature of greed or avarice? You change the, 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 the social setting, the institutions. So as Plato explains, the warrior class, the guardians, they will be denied private property. They must live in common. They must eat in common. They must share all things in common. They must dress in a very similar way so there's no sense of, 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 of different status or envy or, 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 or a desire to do better than the other person for stature, recognition, or importance, and so on. In, in, indeed, marriage was to be banned in Plato's Republic in this ideal because then it's a man and a woman who are bound to each other and, and see a greater importance to themselves and the relationship than the greater good of the society. Now, that didn't mean that sexual intercourse was banned, but without marriage, it, it would be a form of what became later known as, quote, free love. Uh, you, you're attracted to someone, you get in the mood, and you do it. Now, what happens if the doing the big it results in the uh, possibility of little people, children? Well, shortly after the birth, the child would be taken away from the mother and be raised in a city state or government orphanage. And then the, 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 uh, the philosopher kings, the managers of, of the city state would then determine the education and the future of the child, what role it would place in the, in the division of labor of the city state. Now, why would the child be taken away from the mother? Well, that's because the mother would have an attachment to the child. It would place the child's betterment and interests above the community. So, so Plato's conception is implicitly that institutions make the person. And that's because human nature is malleable. Uh, want to change the man? Change the social environment. Uh, if human nature seems to show greed, avarice, selfishness, uh, an individuality inconsistent with the social or common good, then you re-educate that person 
and put them in a social setting in which different institutions and cultural values will change human nature. Human nature is like putty that can be sprinkled with a little bit of water and then remolded into any shape that is desired. Now, this conception that, A, in all settings, selfishness, greed, uh, material acquisition uh, is bad uh, because it runs counter to the, quote, common good, and that we can change these undesirable characteristics by changing the institutional order that, that originates in, in the republic. Uh, has become the model and the conception of, of, of all variations on this collectivist theme. Now, modern socialism, uh, as, as we know it as a movement, uh, emerged in the, in, in the late uh, 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s, the 18th century and the 19th century. Uh, one example of this was, was, was an American, uh, American, excuse me, a British philosopher, political writer named William Godkin, uh, he, he, he wrote a book on, uh, on called Political Justice. It's a fat book published in the 1790s. And he said, why is there poverty in Great Britain? Poverty is in Great Britain because some own, own po property that should be available for the use of all, and they therefore monopolize the, pr the products of this property at the expense of all their neighbors. He even, he even went so far as that once you nationalize property, it's all communal property, people's values, belief systems will change. In fact, th there'll even be a change in, in sexual attraction so that once people are living in common in a non-private property environment, the sex drive will be less, so you won't have to worry about all the population. So changing property, property uh, relationships even can transform the most biological built-in aspects of human nature, and that is the sex drive, according to him. And, and that, that, then, that, then that became sort of a model for all the variations, including Karl Marx. Now, Karl Marx develops his socialism in his scientific socialism of the laws of history, transforming stages of human institutional development, finally going from capitalism to socialism to a post-scarcity communism. But it doesn't change the fact that all of these models are based upon the idea that human nature, when left alone, is bad. And individuals have to be re-educated, re-transformed into a different type of human being who cares less about himself and more about the collective. And that to do this, the society must be institutionally transformed with the abolition of one set of institutions, private property, commerce, trade, the profit motive, and to be remade into a collectivism in which those who have the, the wider knowledge, the vision, the understanding, which the average person does not, being sucked into these bad institutional behavioral habits, they will be the ones who will re-educate and, 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 and do the retraining. It's not surprising, therefore, that when you come to Karl Marx, and in the few places in which he talks about the coming socialist model, the socialist society of the future, he talks about this, this coming about through a, van, a, a, a vanguard of revolutionaries, and that they have the greater vision, they will lead the revolution, and they will have to re-educate the masses who have seen the light enough to rise up against their, their capitalist masters, but will still suffer from a psychology of the old bourgeois mentality. What's in it for me? How can I get more than my neighbor? And therefore, the political elite who understands more, appreciates more, and has the wider vision of the virtuous and good society must use the power of the state to re-educate, remold, and remake huma humanity. And in this setting, they are also in charge of the, of the collectivized means of production that they will act as the planners and the directors for, and in the context of which each individual then must be the pawn, the minion who does what he is bidden, bidden to do by the planners for the good of the society. If one understands this, even in this brief summary that I've tried to give to it, one understands the template, if you will, for every attempt to impose socialism over the last 100 years since the now uh, soon 100th anniversary of the Russian or Bolshevik Revolution of November 1917. And whether it be the, the, the hard totalitarian forms of collectivism and socialism and communism or the Nazi version, National Socialism or Fascism, or whether it be the soft version of the modern interventionist welfare state, as you were suggesting, Jacob, it still implies that with a, a velvet glove instead of the steel fist, man 
has to be redirected. He has to be reguided. He has to be remolded. He has to be commanded and controlled to, to, to suppress his own selfish individualist desires into conforming and being directed in ways that the elite who manage these things know is good and just for all, and which all would accept voluntarily if only they had the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that the elite asserts to possess. Well, I think you see this concept of, of man is basically bad and can't be trusted with freedom in the welfare state. I mean, it's yes. this entire construct is saying you can't trust children to take care of their parents when their parents are in need. You can't trust people to donate to the poor and help others when, when they need that help, that they must be forced to do this. I mean, that's what Social Security is all about, despite what all these seniors say that, oh, there's a fund and I put my money in and I'm going to get it back and so forth. There's no such thing. It's just a straight confiscate and transfer program. And it's based on the notion that you cannot trust young people to honor their mother and father on a voluntary basis. They've got to be forced to do so. And the same thing with all across the board. And it's it's ironic to me because you've got a democratic system here. You don't have a group of um, you know saintly people that is taking control of the government and saying we need to impose this system on everybody because they're all bad and evil and selfish and uncaring, except for this small little group that is forcibly taken over the government. This is a representative democracy. And so the majority here in a nation of supposedly evil, self-centered people, on election day, somehow or another, a majority of them all of a sudden say, well, let's go ahead and convert ourselves into saintly people and have a, a system where we're going to force everybody to be good and caring. And, and you're right, it, the, the steel fist is, is disguised with a velvet glove, but we all know that the steel fist is there with the welfare state. I mean, if you don't believe me, stop paying your, your taxes. Uh, you know, just write the Social Security Administration and say, you know, I'm not going to claim on Social Security. I feel like I'm, I have a right to make this decision on my own, how to use my own money. And so uh, I hereby waive all Social Security benefits. I'm not included in closing my Social Security taxes uh, or income taxes. Well, they will come down you, with you on you with that iron fist. You will see garnishments of your bank account, seizures of your mm -hmm. personal assets. They will seize your wages. They'll harass your employer. And in the extreme case, they will put you in jail. And if you resist being put in jail, they will simply kill you. They'll call it resisting arrest. Uh, so this, this is the construct. It's based on force, and it's a denial of liberty. I mean, this is what, what where we libertarians are distinguished as compared to the welfare status. We believe that people should be free to make these decisions on their own, uh, a separation of charity in the state where everybody keeps what he earns and decides for himself what to do with it. Now, that might mean that there will be people who do not care for others, that, that hoard their own money, that they use it for their own vacations and will not honor their mother and their father when they're in need. But that's part of what freedom's all about. But we also have that conviction that when people are free, most of them will, will respond in positive ways when other people need the assistance. Yes, I, I, I think that they, you know, the, the, the idea of, of, of force behind this uh, relates to the fact that uh, regardless of, of, of how they may view their own intentions, uh, I think that what the classical liberal or the libertarian finds often most frustrating is that when one gets into a serious conversation uh, with an advocate of these forms of intervention and uh, wealth transfer, the welfare state, one soon finds that, 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 that there is an arrogant self-confidence that they look at society and they know that people are living incorrectly, making bad choices, failing to think ahead either for their health care or their retirement or something for their children. Uh, and and, and that, that seeing this failure of people to act in right, rational, and good ways as they're defining it, they have no scruples on saying either an extreme form or a modified form that it is the duty and the responsibility of government, which is ultimately political legitimized force. It is the right and the duty of the government 
to compel people to act in certain ways that these visionaries or advocates of intervention believe is good or to prohibit such conduct and behavior uh, because by, they believe by prohibiting it and re-educating and redirecting people in another way, they can get those people to act in more healthy and good and desirable forms of conduct and to therefore cumulatively make a city better. Now, when you challenge them on this and you say, but surely one fundamental element of a free society is respect for other human beings, tolerance for their choices and diversity, and humility that not to believe that any one of us knows enough to tell our fellow men how they should live and work and interact with others, but that if one has a sense of respect and dignity for the human being, then one says that a civilized way of interacting with our fellow men when we believe that they may have made less than perfect choices is to reason with them, argue with them, attempt to persuade them, or to use our own life or those of others to whom we can point to show as models that different courses of action can generate outcomes or results that they too truly would consider better even for themselves. But that the resort to force is itself a demonstration of a disregard, a disrespect, a contempt for the dignity of other human beings and their free freedom of decision-making and an arrogance that they are going to remold society like that clay into any shape that they consider better, whether it be the extreme totalitarian form or through democratic elections, the interventionist welfare state, which at the end of the day is no less violent, compelling in the sense that, as you're rightly saying, if you do sit and disobey or do not go along or refuse some command or edict, uh, you will be met by the threat and eventually the use of violence, including lethal force. That, that is the difference. Do you believe in the dignity of the individual and that the free individual has not only the right to make his, his own decisions, but to make his own mistakes? And at the, or do you believe that man is something that cannot be trusted and is contemptible and, and untrustworthy who others will mold and remake because they have the arrogance and hubris to believe that they know how the world should look and operate better than human beings themselves. Now, you know, what's one of the interesting aspects of this is that people seem to understand that <laughs> on a personal level. Uh, for example, in the uh, when you go through the grocery store line, sometimes the cashier will say, would you like to donate your change or a dollar to such and such a charity? And each person makes a choice, no thank you, and, and the cashier never says anything. If a person says no, that's the end of the matter. Uh, no, there's no right. argument uh, or persuasion, and nobody is there condemning the person and standing in line saying, oh, you're a bad person for doing this. It's just it's accepted that each person has the right to make this choice, and it's a personal matter, and, and nobody sits there and questions it. Everybody seems to be fine with that. Or like with churches, when the, when the church asks people to donate in the, in the weekly basket, uh, half the people in church do not put anything into that basket. And you don't see people saying, oh, look at him. Oh, boy, you're a bad person and so forth. There's a sense of tolerance that develops. People make their donations anyway, independent of what others are doing. Why is it that people can't? transfer that sense of tolerance and dignity that they give people in those circumstances all across the board so that if a person doesn't want to donate to uh, you know, help his parents out or in some other way help the sick or the needy, why do we need Medicare? Why do we need Medicaid? Why do we need w welfare? Why do we need Social Security? Why can't we have that same dignity? Um, let, let me... Let me um, uh, go, go into another area here, Richard, uh, that I think is a really important aspect of socialism, and that's the central planning aspect. And you've written a lot of this on y in your ebook on monetary central planning, that, that you've got these government institutions that are involved in, in what's, what we call the socialist central planning model. And one of them is the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. There's also the public schooling model where government officials are planning in a top-down fashion the educational decisions of 
millions of children or just even thousands or hundreds in local school districts as compared to a free market where you would have these decisions decentralized and in the hands of families and entrepreneurs and suppliers at of educational vehicles and you've got uh, the drug war is another example of this paternalistic mindset that involves central planning mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about what central planning in, is involved and how it fits within this socialist paradigm right the the, the very notion uh, uh, in socialist thinking uh, throughout the uh, 19th century into the 20th century was the, was the contrast that they saw was anarchy of production versus rational planning for the good of the society. Uh, socialists have viewed that the pursuit of profit it, it involves not a concern for the producing of things that people want, but which the individual businessman may make the most money out of, uh, at, at, with the presumption that that which is profitable is not necessarily in itself socially good or desirable. So, for instance, let us suppose that people prefer to, to, to uh, go and, and watch uh, comedy movies in the movie theater more than going to symphonic uh, performances of an orchestra playing classical music uh, at, at, at the conservatory, for instance. Uh, now, the market will respond to that. If people prefer to watch comedy movies than listen to classical music in, in, in the music uh, theater, then where is the investable money going to go? to making comedy movies to watch in the movie theater as opposed to paying uh, reasonable salaries, salaries to attract enough or really quality classical musicians to play in that orchestra. Now, there will be some people who say, but, 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 but look at the low taste of people. Look, 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 look at how, 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 how they, they have no interest in, 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 uh, in, in, in finer music, right, Beethoven, Mozart, Vivaldi, and so on. And they say, this is because businessmen have attempted to get people to prefer comedy movies than classical music. With the presumption is it's the businessman searching for profit that artificially makes consumers want things that they would not want if they were only more enlightened by, by others, a broader perspective. That if, if they only were good enough and not manipulated by the businessmen in the pursuit of profit, they would want to go to hear Beethoven and Mozart in, in a classical music performance. Now, they also this 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 ends up in them rejecting Adam Smith's point in 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 the in the in the wealth of nations, his famous metaphor of the invisible hand, because as as Smith says, in 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 the market economy where there's private property and voluntary exchange, if Jacob Hornberger has something that Richard Evelyn wants, and if the rules of the society preclude me hitting Jacob Hornberger over the head, uh, killing him to get it, ma manipulating and deceiving him, then the only way I can get Jacob to give me what he has that I desire is for me to devote myself to applying my knowledge, abilities, capacities, creativity, to asking what is it that Jacob wants more than what he possesses now, and that he'd be willing to take and trade from me in exchange for what he has that I desire. Therefore, for me to acquire what I want, my profit motive of improving my life, I must focus on what is it that Jacob desires to improve his life from the mundane to the profound. In that context, okay, the profit motive is production for use. Production for profit is production for, for use because the, the, the only thing that is profitable is someone is, is for something that someone values values more highly than the cost of the businessman to bring it to market. But rejecting that view, they believe that, the, that market competition and the profit motive is, 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 is wasteful, inefficient, misdirected, harmful to what people really need. So the idea of taking away private property, nationalizing it, collectivizing it, socializing it, to use these synonyms of how they've always expressed it, and to put it under the control of government, and that the government then will centrally plan what gets produced, where it gets produced, how it gets produced, in what quantities, and who will do the working to bring it to, mar to, 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 the, to the socialist society for people to consume. Now, th there are several problems with this, uh, th that all of which could be discussed. First of all, it denies the individual the right to decide what he wishes to do with his own life as a producer. The state will command you in what role you'll have in the a social system of division of labor. It dictates to the consumer not what he may want, 
with the qualities, varieties, characteristics, and, qu and quantities, but what the state thinks he is a member of the greater mass need and deserve and should have. And finally, how shall the state, and this is the Austrian economic criticism developed by particularly Mises and Hayek, how will the central planner know what to produce in the most cost-efficient way? He won't. The, the abolition of private property does away with markets. And if you do away with markets, there's no setting in which people can buy and sell. If there's no buying and selling, then there's no higgling over terms of trade. If there's no higgling over terms of trade, then there's no prices, both for consumer goods, what is it that Jacob Hornberger might like and be willing to buy and what value he places upon it if Richard Evelyn were to do the producing. But at the same time, it abolishes the prices of the factors of production because the government owns everything. What is the most highly valued use for different types of labor? What are the alternative profitable applications for machinery, resources, raw materials, the allocation and use of land? Should it be more farmland? Should it be a new hospital building? Should it be a, 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 a for-profit park that people want to take advantage of for recreational purposes? Or should it be additional residential housing? Because people need a place to live somewhere as well. There's no guide for this. Because since businessmen cannot make a judgment as to what consumers want, they cannot turn around to the resource market and then compete against each other based upon their evaluations of consumer prices as to what it would be worth to hire re workers to purchase capital machinery, to rent or purchase land, etc. So there's no rational way of knowing how to use the scarce resource of, resources of society through, through the actions of the entrepreneur to make that which we as real consumers, as private individuals, want and value enough to make it profitable for someone to do the enterprising. And therefore, you result with plan, you end up with planned chaos, a mismatching of supply and demand, shoddy products, poorly made products, inefficiently made products, in the terms that they end up costing us in resource and value far more than a more rational market-based system would give us. Therefore, it denies freedom. It abolishes choice. It constrains people to do what the government commands us to do. And it results in the production of everything with economic irrationality. In other words, a socialist to command society is the end of, of human society of any rational and productive form. Yeah, aren't you raising the old socialist calculation <laughs> debate where the, Absolutely. the Austrians really pointed out the fundamental inherent problem with socialism and that is that it doesn't have the means of calculating uh, right. that in a free market, people can calculate on whether to invest in this this product or this business or this line of work because there's prices. And those prices are coming to existence because people are trading with each other. But when the government right. owns everything, there are no trades taking place because the, it's just one entity. And, and didn't it also happen in the socialist calculation debate where the Austrians were skewering the socialists on this, where the socialists said, well, look, you're right. They, they told Ludwig von Mises, you're right, that we can't calculate, but we'll use the prices that are being established in the United States as a model for our socialist system. <laughs> well, which implies that socialism cannot exist unless there is at least some free market somewhere in the world. Uh, but, but even right. then, Richard, it, the whole construct would lead to, to planned chaos anyway, wouldn't it? Correct. Absolutely. Because uh, uh, even, even with the idea that, you know, many people say, but how can you say that socialism can't work? Is there not the Soviet Union? Is there not China? Is there not Poland? Is there not Cuba? Uh, and so on. And the answer to that was two things, uh, I would argue. First, uh, on the one hand, uh, th they could use the prices that they observed in Western still functioning market economies as, quote, shadow prices to sort of act as a guide to do many things. But, but even and, – and, of course, a socialist economy can exist because the government can command things. I mean, the Soviet Union – directed resources into military hardware. They were the second superpower in terms of uh, nuclear missiles and so on. If you throw enough resources at something and command people to put it together, you're going to get something, however inefficient and, and, and wasteful it may be. So, of course, a socialist economy can exist. And, of course, in, in, in a world in which it's, as it used to be, half communist and half, quote, free, unquote, you could use the prices of the West as sort of 
educators and guide. But even that did not solve their problem. Because the point is, is that the, 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 let's take the Soviet economy and Soviet Russia. It was not a carbon copy of the economy in the U.S. Different types of workers with different labor skills, different types of resource and raw materials, different types and qualities of capital equipment, different types of land and its potential to be cultivated. So it was not a carbon copy of saying, well, we just have to do what's doing in America, and it just perfectly matches. And, the, and that is due to the fact that two different locations are totally different. And as a consequence, you can't just use them. And therefore, in spite of having, in an indirect way, uh, Western prices to use, mismatching between supplies and demand, poorly made products, m misallocated products, uh, empty shelves, uh, shelves with goods that nobody wanted to buy. So the fact was, even with these shadow prices from the West, the socialist economy was a disaster. All right. Well, on that note, we're out of time, and so that sums up our, our case against socialism. Richard, as always, greatly enjoyed the conversation and the visit, and I look forward to seeing you next week. And my pleasure, too, and I want to once more thank our viewers and listeners for taking the time to share this little bit of, of discussion with us. Thank you. Yeah, and have a great time in, in Guatemala where you, you're going to be giving those lectures on uh, based on the Austrian book, and uh, which is available on our website and, uh, and also at Amazon.com. And, 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 and the video uh, based on the Austrian series is on our website as well. So thanks again, Richard, thank and I'll you. see you next week. Thank you.